Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the first of E Pluribus Unum's Truth, Action, and Reconciliation Conversation Series. We're so grateful that all of you have chosen to spend the next hour with us. I want to thank the entire EPU team for helping put this together and the support of the Emerson Collective. When we founded the E Pluribus Unum Fund in 2018, we did so with the idea that to fulfill America's promise of justice and opportunity for all, we will have to break down the barriers and systems that have been designed to divide us for generations. One of the most frequent refrains we heard in all of our travels last year to 28 communities in 13 states and over a thousand interviews was that people rarely had honest conversations about race. And if they did, those conversations rarely led to any meaningful or deep action or change. So today we join with the millions of Americans who are pleading for, demanding that we have these conversations and we are committed as a group and as a people to create action around those conversations. So we begin the series with conversations today that center on truth, where over the next five weeks, we will discuss the price that we have all paid for our racist past and the systems that were designed to divide us as a result. We are bringing together our country's greatest thinkers, activists and leaders on the issues of race and equity to help us have those conversations that take us through our history not around it, not over it, not under, but through it, because that is what's necessary to get to the other side. That is the only way we will begin a journey towards reconciliation and redemption for our beloved country. We will cover criminal justice, health equity, economic equity, and democracy in our topics. But today, we are starting with a primer about our history, from our founding and slavery to the Civil War, to Reconstruction, to Jim Crow, and the Civil Rights Era. And so I'm happy to introduce our fantastic and esteemed panel today. We are joined by Dr. Drew Faust, who is an E Pluribus Unum National Advisory Council member. She is President Emerita of Harvard University and was the first woman to lead that great institution. She is the author of six books about the Civil War era, including the highly acclaimed Mothers of Invention and This Republic of Suffering, Death, and the American Civil War. Dr. Tamika Simmons is the Director of Local Government Leadership Institute at Delta State University. Her research interests include professional and racial identity development, teaching efficacy, and municipal and community leadership. We are so happy to have her join us in Greenville, Mississippi, and she was with us with our launch last fall. Thank you. And Dr. Eddie Gloud, Jr. He is the Chair of the Center for African American Studies at Princeton University. His new book, which is on the shelves right now, so go buy one, is Begin Again, James, Ball, James Baldwin's America and its urgent lessons for our own. It's a must read. It is already a bestseller and I highly encourage you to go out and get it. I know how busy all of you are. So I thank all of you for joining us for what is sure to be a great discussion today. Thank you all so much. And now Dr. Faust. Yeah. Good afternoon. It's such a pleasure to be here and especially great pleasure to be here in the company of Professor Simmons and Professor Glaude. We have a lot of history to cover. Mitch has given us quite a task and so I think we should just get to it. I'm struck as I think about the racial reckoning underway in the United States today, which of course is very much focused on present day injustices and demands for change. And yet at the same time, it's very much concerned with the past. Why is history so important at this time? And which, which aspects of our history do you think are most critical to this current moment? You know, uh, it's such a thank, first of all, thank you, Dr. Faust for, for, uh, for shepherding us through this, this broad <laughs> conversation. Um, it's such an important question. And, 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 you know, I guess because I'm grappling with James Baldwin, he comes to mind. And in 1965, he wrote a wonderful essay entitled The White Man's Guilt. It was published in Ebony on, and against the backdrop of, of Watts on fire in some ways. And he says, the great force of history is that we carry it with us. History is always present, mm -hmm. you know. And so in this moment, as we're grappling with uh, uh, police uh, uh, reform or defunding the police, wherever you stand in that debate, there's also this attempt to grapple with public memory. How do we account for 
how we've arrived at this moment. And it's centered around, you know, in some ways, Confederate statues, who we've decided to honor. And in some ways, that, that argument, that debate involves the very ways in which we have engaged in a kind of disregard around the ways in which race has organized our lives in this country, right? A kind of reckoning that involves reckoning with the lost cause and how it continues to animate and organize our lives in this moment, mm -hmm. not just in the South, but across the nation as a whole. Well, let me push you a little bit on Baldwin, and um, I'm going to tell everyone what you just told us, which is <laughs> Professor Glaude just found that his book uh, is number five on the bestseller list. So not only is it a bestseller, it's a, a way up there in the sky's <laughs> bestseller. So congratulations. Thank you. There's a quote I think of from James Baldwin where he talks about people being trapped in history and history being trapped in them. And I think right. for the project that we're all launching on with EPU, we want to get out of that trap. And is there a way that Baldwin sees out of that trap that um, history can be changed to be a positive force rather than to entrap and imprison all of us? Right. I mean, in some ways, he, 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 it's a basic response that we have to tell the truth. We have to engage in an honest encounter, an unflinching mm -hmm. encounter, as he put it, an unflinching encounter with our ghastly failures. Mm -hmm. Right. Because he says the trouble is deeper than we thought because mm -hmm. the trouble is in us. Mm -hmm. And from that same essay that, we, that I mentioned earlier, he has this wonderful line. He says, a people that imagines history flatters them are impaled by that history like a butterfly on a pen. Ooh. So the way in which we tell our story, if it's, if it's a story that secures our innocence, that deepens our willful blindness, that allows us to believe that we are paragons of virtue, without really understanding, right? The bitterness that's at the bottom of the cup as William James would say, mm -hmm. or, or all of the shards that make up the basis of the life that we live, those, those broken glasses that's underneath our feet. Um, then it leads to a kind of moral irresponsibility. So Baldwin in, insists that we encounter history, you know, confront it directly because it's moving us about now. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if we dare to be otherwise, we have to tell ourselves a different kind of story. Mm -hmm. Dr. Simmons, what's wrong with the story that has prevailed about our history? And, and what are the elements that must be overturned and confronted in order to arrive at the kind of liberation from the trap that, that we've just been chatting about? Absolutely. I think that in order to talk about any forward movement or even to understand present context, we have to begin to weave in a better understanding of history and how it has colored where we are and where we're going from the ships of 1619 to the Emancipation Proclamation to the Civil Rights Movement, the, including the murder of Emmett Till and the murder of Martin Luther King Jr. and most recently the murder of George Floyd. The constant has been racism and the fight of Black America for social equity, equality, and justice and the notion that conditions for Black folks are made better after every pivotal moment is just untrue. In fact, in some cases, it's made worse through systems and the intentional lack of inclusion where perceived advancements are always met with a systemic barrier. And we have to talk about these conditions because we keep seeing a repeat of history. That's why this conversation is so important. So we can be begin to do what we have failed to do, and that is be intentional and honest about the discussion of race, we find ourselves in this position because too many continue to ask, why are these conversations important? And that question is rooted in a privilege that not all Americans have. And that privilege comes at a cost. And that cost is the price people of color continue to pay to live in America because the harsh, hard, brutal, and bloody fact is that before we talk about Plessy versus Ferguson and a train ride, we have to talk about Armistad. And before we talk about George Floyd's cry for his mama, we have to talk about Mama Mamie Till's cry to the world about her son. Before we can talk about income and educational inequities, we have to talk about the burning of Black Wall Street and anti-literacy laws. And I have to thank Mayor Landrew not only for these important conversations, but for this social transformation initiative of E Pluribus Unum that faces racism 
and America head on. And that's where the history has left us today in a place mm -hmm. where we can no longer move productively into the future until we commit to the continued reconciliation of our past. There's a word that you use that I think is so, there are many words you use that are important, but there's one that I'd like to drill down on a little bit, and that's the word system and systemic. And I think very much in the current moment, the idea of a system of perpetuating injustice and the way that has operated in the face of, as you described it, um, Dr. Simmons, seeming improvements and everything solved, only it's not solved at all. How? How should we think about this system? What are the his, some of the historical systems that people should understand in order to recognize the way systemic racism operates in our own time? And how has inequity and racism been perpetuated across different systems through many centuries? Well, to start, uh, the remnants of inequitable systems continue to play out through de facto segregation in schools across the South, where many impoverished families and students of color are educated in failing public schools, while white families and students attend private academies designed for white children and primarily controlled by white people. The remnants of segregated two sides of the track living continue to play out in the very real reality of redlining and white flight and the remnants of vagrancy laws continue to play out when the police are called on black folks for just living, walking through the neighborhood, sitting in a Starbucks, or just sleeping in your own bed. Even the enslavement of African Americans is relived through an overrepresentation of black people in prisons and jails. And just as African American babies were subjected to the cruelties of slavery at birth, we see a continued attack on children of color when we look at their disproportionate number of uh, individuals suspended, expelled, and, and recommended for specialized education. And what we see when we look across history is that new oppressive systems always replace old ones. And this is the cycle that must be broken that can only happen through a reimagining of an America not built on the backs of slaves, but building now alongside brothers and sisters of every race, creed, and tongue in a way that unifies rather than devise us. Mm. Professor Glott, tell us a bit about some of the historical systems and how they evolved. Why wasn't the end of slavery the end of inequity? Why wasn't a change, say, um, with Brown v. Board? Why wasn't that the end of inequity? How, how does this persist through well, it, yeah. these, these well, moments when there's hope and aspiration and then somehow racism grabs hold tight as tight as ever. Well, in my work, you know, I, I tend to think that they're underneath this, all of this is what I call the value gap, right? And that is this belief that white people matter more than others and how that belief takes shape in how we're habituated, how our dispositions are formed and shaped. And so unless those habits are uprooted, unless that idea that because of the color of your skin, you ought to be valued differently than others. And then, dis and then you see the distribution of advantage and disadvantage along that valuation. Mm -hmm. We're gonna find ourselves in these repeated cycles. So we can think about this historically. Let's think about it in terms of two historical coordinates. One, we can think about the second founding and that's the Civil War and Reconstruction. I'm, in, I'm on, I gotta be careful here because this is your area, Dr. Fowler. Go for it. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, you think about, you know, the Civil War, it's the moment in which we have the founding of the modern U.S. nation state. An idea of citizenship untethered from race emerges in this kind, in this instance. 13, 14, 15th Amendments. In some ways, radical reconstruction is an attempt to do our first works over in interesting sorts of ways. But what happens in this moment? There's an immediate counter-revolution. And that counter-revolution is rooted in a set of assumptions about who ought to be valued and who who ought to be devalued, who ought to be extended dignity, and who ought to be disregarded. So even in someone like uh, Walt Whitman, the bard of American democracy, right? When you read the early editions of the Leaves of Grass, he's, con he's decidedly anti-slavery, anti he's abolitionist. You even have a character in the poem, right? That, that is representative of his anti-slavery position. But by the time you get to the last version or the edition of Leaves of Grass, He's redacted all of that because he doesn't believe black people should be accorded citizenship. He thinks we're baboons, right? In some ways, as he as he as he quoted it in um, 
in his Brooklyn editorial. So part of what we see in these moments of possible transformation is a reassertion of the value gap that then leads to policy decisions, right? In whether it's Jim Crow laws, whether it's convict leasing, right? There's a way in which Birmingham gets built, right? <laughs> There's a way in which, uh, uh, you know, Anglo-Saxonism begins to take over and how this lays the foundation for a certain understanding of America that then reinforces, right, the distribution of advantage and disadvantage, one historical coordinate. Another historical coordinate is the mid 20th century, the black freedom struggle. You think about uh, from what, Brown v. Board, which overturns Plessy, right, from 1896 to 1954. You think of the Montgomery, the Montgomery bus, bus, bus boycott in 50, 1950, the student sit-ins in 60, Dr. King's March in 63, March on Washington, not just simply Dr. King's, passage of civil rights legislation, Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65, Selma, Watts explodes from 64 to 68, urban centers are exploding all around the country, Car Stokely Carmichael Kwame Ture announces that we're not going to save freedom now anymore, we're going to hit Black Power, Black Panther Party founded in October 66. What do we see? We see this clamoring for first class citizenship and then slow walking of the state and then, an on, then just a simple betrayal. Black anger expressed, right? A, form, a different form of black politics expressed. And then what do we get? We get calls for law and order. Another building block of the carceral state. What do we get? We get the tax revolt in California. Mm -hmm which erodes any public infrastructure of care, which begins to lay the foundation of shredding whatever the great society, whatever the great society tried to do and whatever the New Deal tried to do. 12 years after the passage of the uh, Fair Housing Act of 1968, we elect Ronald Reagan, who is charged to dismantle it all. What is that? That's a reassertion of the belief that whiteness ought to accord you a certain kind of value a certain kind of benefit. And unless we uproot that, I mean, there's an even apocryphal story, I don't know if it's true or not, where John Adams tells King George, we will not be your Negroes. At the very moment in which he's giving voice to an idea of freedom, it's predicated upon an intimate understanding of unfreedom. And that notion is the through line in our history, up to the point to where we now have Donald Trump, which is the latest instance of that backlash. That's a marvelous pricey of American history. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm struck by the notion of truth that's at the center of the work of uh, EPU and what I think is partly our work. We're the truth panel here. Um, how do we find a true history? And what's striking to me is how there are these moments where society says, all right, well, the work is done. You know, slavery's over, the work is done, and, and a kind of delusion that there's no inequity left, and then something else happens, and there's no inequity left. And a failure on the part of Americans of so, so many different backgrounds to recognize the continuing oppression um, mm -hmm. that is built into the system. And I felt that so powerfully when we elected a Black president, and there was all this noise about now we're post-racial, it's all done. And, and so I think part of truth is recognizing how it's not done and this reemergence of the um, superiority, notions of white superiority just keeps making it not done. One, mm -hmm. just one place you didn't mention that I think is often stunning to people to understand is how the New Deal was oh. structured in such a powerfully pro-white way that um, in order to keep the Southern senators on board with the Democratic Party, Franklin Roosevelt made all these appalling compromises and didn't include, for example, domestic labor or agricultural labor in many of the New Deal benefits. Or then we look after World War II and we see how housing benefits were made available or not available based on race. And so we have to, I think, somehow figure out how to get over this possibility that so many white people have taken advantage of, of dismissing it as work is done, we don't need to worry about that anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not sure how exactly that aligns with your notion of, of value. I think they're consistent, but maybe one feeds the other in, in a sense. And the history, if we get, we can get people to get this history it right in an irrefutable way, can that dig into this reevaluation 
that, that you're talking about? Can that force that kind of reevaluation? I, I think so. You know, I, I think um, one of the things that, I mean, I think the point to the New Deal is so important because this is the period in which we begin to see the emergence of the vaunted American middle class, mm -hmm. right? So the wealth gap that we're experiencing today isn't just simply, isn't the result of the laziness of black people, right? That they lack fortitude. Yes. Yeah. That it's a policy decision. Yep. That, that when we begin to ask certain sorts of questions about structural systemic inequality, the, the argument has been that that is a result of bad choices, yeah. of a kind of culture, kind of, of pathology. Thing. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it, it, it's beyond one's thinking because you have to assume that millions of Black people are making bad choices simultaneously all the time over generations mm -hmm. in order for that argument to even be plausible, right? So if it's the case that how valuation is evidenced in policy then results in these material conditions, the only way that we're going to get at this is not only tell the truth, but by policies that seek to repair what we have done in, mm -hmm. in a very deliberate way, it seems mm -hmm. to me. And I, I know Dr. Simmons has, was kind of gesturing at this in her earlier comments, right? This systemic, mm -hmm. I, this systemic inequality is not the result of individual acts of discrimination now. Yep. This is accumulated, right? Accumulated um, uh, inequality over time that manifests itself in what opportunities come before particular communities mm -hmm. and what opportunities do not come before mm -hmm. others. I, 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 I wanted to add a, a bit to that also from a little bit of a different angle as well. When we think about grappling with the truth of who we are as a nation and being willing to ingest that and just let that sit for a moment uh, mm -hmm. in our understanding of how other groups of people experience America. And when we don't do that, it creates a delay in our understanding of just what the issues are, because we cannot contextualize it in the sickness that has impacted us all of this time. Even now, America appears to be opening her eyes to her founding flaws. And we kind of ebb and flow in and out of this in a historical context all the time. There always seems to be we're, we're kind of at the, the bridge of an awakening. And then again, there's a reasserting. There's a reasserting. Uh, and, and where we are now with the push and the cry for equity and the dismantling of systems and the calling out of, of, of racist uh, 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 symbols, uh, that is to be applauded. However, we only now begin to see wider shifts in the business sector, uh, in the changing of company mascots and the calling out of racist symbols. symbols. It is uh, natural to question whether or not this is a true awakening and a new learning of racial injustice, or are we just feeling the heat in this moment in time? Uh, here in the great state of Mississippi where I live, uh, I know what heat feels like. Uh, and, uh, and just recently, June 28th, the Mississippi legislature passed a bill to remove the state flag due to its Confederate symbol. And, and, and that same narrative of not knowing or being clear about the impact of history that these things must just now be occurring is, is just false because the truth of the matter is that the for 126 years, the state of Mississippi flew that flag. And just like Mississippi's old flag and the old flag of Georgia and Florida, Arkansas, Alabama, and other states who had the Confederate symbol in that flag, racism, just like with those flags, have been hiding in plain sight for more than 100 years. And the monuments like those that Mayor Landry began taking down in New Orleans and those around the country who are calling to be removed, that stuff has been in our face for years. They didn't just emerge. And we are naive to think that those symbols are benign. They represent the lifeblood of a racist ideology that is a cancer to our nation. We have to accept that first. That's the beginning part. We cannot hide from that. 
We can't glorify that. We can't revise the record on what that means. We have to accept that. And we have to then look to see how can we not repeat the wrongs of history by understanding where we went wrong the first time around. And so our challenge from my perspective, it appears more so that this country's true history of racial injustice has been ignored. And again, this is a point of privilege and comfort that comes with living on the positive side of oppressive systems and institutionalized injustices. And why has it taken a long time for folks to kind of come to this realization? Because privilege is comfortable and privilege can be blinding. So again, uh, it appears that America is opening her eyes to some of her founding flaws, but we can't stop there. We have to be committed to correcting the flaws and making the privilege of American living accessible to everybody moving forward. And again, that comes with understanding historical context, ingesting what that means, and using that to heal as opposed to divide. So what is making this window possible? I, I think about even a few years ago, even when Mitch took down the statues in New Orleans, yeah. the pu public opinion was in a different place from where it seems to be now, according to polling data. What, and general attitudes, what, what has enabled this shift? How can we hold on to whatever it is that's begun to enable this shift, this greater clarity about the um, unacceptable nature of extolling the Confederate past? Um, the military is open to changing the names of bases. I, I'm stunned at that. It's great, but I'm amazed. So what, what has opened this up? Is it all the suffering of the pandemic somehow? Or has that made us think differently? Or think about what community means? I'm really interested to see what Dr. Simmons says about this. <laughs> then well, it's, um, I immediately think of Fannie Lou Hamer and her famous quote of being sick and tired of being sick, and, sick tired. and tired. You kind of have to bubble up into this collective sickness of being tired of the same thing happening over and over and over again. Everything that is occurring now on the national stage where we are beginning to see more of the police brutality, we're beginning to see more of what's happening across our, our nation in terms of the inequities along the lines of health as we look at how mm -hmm. COVID is impacting communities mm -hmm. of color. Mm -hmm. All of these things, again, point back toward uh, how important it is for us to understand, for us to understand where we come from in order to, 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 to imagine where we are going to go. You know, I would identify three elements really quickly. Uh, one, what I think would be a kind of common sense of vulnerability, uh, that the global pandemic has opened us all up uh, to a sense that, you know, nothing is secure, even though it's hitting us differentially, and we need to be mindful that it's really devastating Native peoples, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the communities of Native peoples at this point. But I think, you know, COVID-19 uh, reperiodizes how we understand uh, America, right? There's going to be America before COVID-19 and then America post COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And because I don't think how we how we exist together has fundamentally changed. And I don't know if there's going to be a going back to anything mm -hmm. uh, in this context. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is that it's also the result of, of activism, right? So this is, you know, what we see uh, around police uh, brutality is, is a result of what we saw in 2014 in Ferguson. And what we have been seeing over the last decade or so of grassroots organizers trying to, to, to open up space for a different conversation around public safety. So the phrase defund the police isn't just something that was made up. It actually comes out of a grassroots community, a grassroots movement and effort. So what we know is that we have uh, everyday on the ground organizers throwing their bodies on the lines, putting themselves into the breach in order to open it and to give us this opportunity. And then I think the third element, so you know, there's the pandemic, there's grassroots activists who are doing on the ground work. I think there's a generational shift. We're seeing it in our politics in the sense that, you know, for the first time in, in you know, millennials and Gen, Gen Zers outnumber baby boomers. And, we're, and I think that generation um, 
understands that America's broken, right? They're a generation and has come of age in catastrophe, whether it's Katrina, whether it's the Great Recession, whether it's mass school shootings, whether it's police murders, whether it's climate change, global pandemic, right? Having to come home, no jobs, arranged. So they are experiencing America not in any idealized sense, right? But in they, they may very well, well have been concluded that the country is broken. Now, that doesn't mean that they're by definition going to go progressive. I mean, Dylan Roof isn't a baby boomer, after all. Richard Spencer isn't a baby boomer. Right, so just like we see across the globe, people are moving either either towards a more progressive politics, or they're turning or banking right, and embracing fascism or, or authoritarian or autocratic leadership. So I think there these three elements exist in the midst of a public lynching, caught on camera for eight minutes and forty six seconds, um, and I think it's the convergence of those that the, those factors against the backdrop of the obvious incompetence and racialized ideology of, 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 of the occupant of the White House that gives us this, this, this opportunity, it seems mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I want to just add, because Dr. Glaude, that was just a beautiful rendition of everything that was reeling through my mind on this particular item that we're talking about right now. It, it really just appears to be a perfect storm of various elements moving together and, and, and it's historic in that nature. And so I want to ask uh, the two of you, Dr. Foss and Dr. Glaude, and in thinking about the elements of this perfect storm, Dr. Glaude, which you've already listed some, in what ways is this storm similar to storms we've seen before across the historical narrative? where there's a shift in the tide, and then there's a change that follows, and then there's the pushback and regression. I want to so, hear Dr. Faust. <laughs> so let me um, take a point of personal privilege here about what you just said about baby boomers. Being a baby boomer myself, um, I think we could say that there was a moment when my generation attacked the complacency and dishonesty and inequity that was so much a part of 1950s civilization and challenged so many hierarchies of race and gender and privilege. And yet we are now a disappointment to the world as you just outlined. And the notion that you have to abandon the baby boomers in order to take the next step. Maybe it's just that 50 years from now, somebody will be on a show on I don't know what technology saying, Oh, good grief. Thank God the millennials are done with, or the Gen Zs <laughs> are done with. We can move on to some people and get some things done. But I would say, Dr. Simmons, in response to you, that, that that was a time when a lot of upheaval was going on, that I would begin it pretty soon after the war with the uh, efforts of Thurgood Marshall and others to change the legal systems and then student activism and just deep-seated challenges to assumptions that perhaps did not yield what they should have. So is there a lesson in why they didn't yield more that would be useful for those who are activists today? Yeah, uh, it seems to me that in each of these moments of moral reckoning, um, we, we end up doubling down on our ugliness, right? That's, that's, that's the, that's the, that's the tragic irony of, of American history in some ways, right? That, that there's the progress that is made, but you don't want to just simply say that, you know, uh, 1903 is the same as 1863 and the same as 1943. You know, you don't want to make that sort of claim, but there is a consistent through line, as I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, and it asserts itself under material, it reasserts itself under different material conditions. And which arrests, right, really fundamental transformation in the country. I mean, I've been struck by the way in which we talk about, um, you know, our current moment as being uh, 1918, uh, 1929, and 1968 all rolled into one. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking about 1918 and, and the influenza epidemic, a pandemic then, and I was thinking no one is talking about what happened in the second wave. So in the midst of the second wave of, of the quote unquote Spanish flu, 
were the racial program, pogroms of 1919. Mm -hmm. right? What was happening in Chicago? What was happening in East St. Louis? How did that set the stage for what happened in Tulsa? Tulsa. What, happened, what happened in Elaine, Arkansas, right? Where you had literal, literally white communities engaging in extraordinary violence directed at black communities, mm -hmm. right, in this moment. And how do we account for a moment in which uh, a virus is literally ravaging the nation and then it is tethered to, right, uh, this extraordinary racial violence. And here we are in our own moment, right, where a pandemic, a global pandemic is disrupting everything about our normal lives. And we still see police killing black folk at rates as if there wasn't a pandemic. Mm -hmm. What does it suggest? It suggests that at the heart of the country, right, is this idea that my life isn't worth as much as someone else's life who happens to be white. And one of the reasons why we always find ourselves really quickly in this moment, and this goes back to an earlier question that Dr. Faust asked us, Dr. Simmons, and I think we find ourselves returning back because many of us view racial justice as a philanthropic enterprise. As long as white America is thinking that racial justice and racial equality is something that they can give to people as a charitable gesture, as opposed to building a more just world, then when they finish giving charity, they're gonna go back to their segregated spaces and pat themselves on the back like they did in the aftermath of the Civil War and Reconstruction, like they did when King says, it seems that people were so much more concerned about civility than they were about justice. They were more concerned about Bull Connor's dogs and hoses than they were about justice, right? So if we view racial justice and racial equality as a charitable enterprise or a philanthropic gesture, as something white Americans can give to me or to us, then we're caught in a frame that dooms us to repeat it, or to echo Jimmy, to go back where we began, we're trapped. So there's a theme throughout all of the elements of this conversation that I think is worth just noting, and that's violence, and mm. the way violence has been used in such an appalling manner as a tool to reinforce these systems. And Dr. Glad, you raised some questions about how much continuity is there over time. Is nothing different since 1619? Yes, things are different, though there is a historiography right now that is minimizing those differences. But I think we need to understand how one theme that just reverberates again and again is this physical violence that comes directly out, I think, of the value assumptions that you described. Mm -hmm. If someone who's not worth something can be subjected to a kind of violence that would not be acceptable if you regarded that person in a different manner. But I think we need to ask ourselves, we're a very violent country, and how much of our identity as Americans has been shaped by violence and by the racial foundations of mm. that violence, um, and, and yeah. how does that move, move us forward? Um, how do we think about that going forward? I just want to make a remark about the two of you because you're both from Mississippi and <laughs> you're up in Mississippi. And that seems to me to give us an opportunity to hear a little bit about that most Southern of Southern states, the state that had the um, kind of most difficult time in terms of civil rights, the place where the South was most Southern, where race was most uh, violently, I think, um, instantiated. H how do you see these stories of history playing out in, in relationship to your identities as Mississippians and the opportunities, perhaps, that you can see and define and understand because of coming from that place? Mississippi, goddamn, as Nina Simone. <laughs> Nina Simone said, yeah. Dr. Blige, you want to start? You, no, I, I just finished talking. Please, please. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I always like to share um, how people often ask me, and, and I think every Mississippian has been asked this question at some point by folks who don't live in Mississippi, or maybe who've never been to Mississippi, how can you live in Mississippi? <laughs> and, you know, I always ask, well, how can you live in America, right? <laughs> because the same oppressive systems that exist in Mississippi exist across America. 
The same brutal and bloody stories that color Mississippi's history also color every city and town across the nation. And the reality that many Miss Americans refuse to face and own is that Mississippi is America. And yet, I love Mississippi. That's, that's my home state, the nation's hospitality state, where you can get hot tomatoes, hot <laughs> greens, and an icebox pie all in one place. <laughs> and what I can say is that I love the people of Mississippi. I'm not tied to the assorted oppressive history. And when we align our allegiance to the humanity of who we are, to the humanity of America, right? Mm. And we can see how a Mississippi exists and we still love it. We can see how an America can exist and we still love it. None of us, not well, not, not a lot of people are running off to other countries right now. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know if I'm speaking erroneously. Not in. <laughs> but we are proud Americans, even with our sordid history. And we're patriotic in that way. And, and, and I see myself in terms of my identity as a Mississippian as, as central as I see myself as an American. And again, oftentimes folks see the South as kind of this disconnected piece of the nation. Kind of we just own the South when we have to. No, the South is America. And mm. until we embrace our relationship with the South, and until we see ourselves in the mirror, in that Southern mirror, right, reflecting back on us, then we're going to disconnect from the narrative around race. We're going to disconnect Great. from the ills that continue to challenge us across the nation. We're going to say that doesn't happen here. That happens somewhere else, when in fact it happens every mm -hmm. place from sea to shining right. sea. See, and so, you know, I, it's All a necessary honesty about it, yeah. though, I think, yeah. Yeah, you Dr. know, there's, some, there's something about, you know, one can look at the Southern landscape, to look at uh, the state of Mississippi, the, the nature of Mississippi. I grew up on the coast. You can see moss dangling from magnolia trees, um, and it's hauntingly beautiful. Um, but nature is also carries with it dangers. Mississippi is not the best place to camp out at night, uh, given uh, horse flies and, 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 <laughs> and, 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 and snakes. And all, and this, so there's this kind of contradiction in the land, in the beauty of the mm -hmm. state. Underneath it is all of this ugliness that happens in interesting sorts of ways. There's a reason why Mississippi was called a closed society mm -hmm. at one point, right? Uh, but at the same time, Richard Wright, your Dory Welty, Tennessee Williams. Oh my God, has any state produced Faulkner. the kind of artist, Faulkner, the artist that the state has produced, the mm -hmm. blues, I mean, we can go down the line, yeah. right? And so there's the contradiction of the violence of the state and the beauty of its artistic expression, right? In some ways, Mississippi, as Dr. Simmons has said, is an extraordinary metaphor for the country, right? We want to reject Southern exceptionalism. We want mm -hmm. to reject... Mm -hmm. It's underneath Gunnar Myrdal's idea of the American dilemma, that if only we lived in accordance with our values, that we just need to get this region right. <laughs> and when we, if we understand more fundamentally what a state like Mississippi represents, the contradiction and lies that we've told ourselves, because underneath it all, the intimacy of our living. Right? There's a reason why you look at my my daddy's side of the family and folk got green eyes and straight hair. There's a reason why you got this very, this, these different hues, what was happening under the cover of night and the violence that, that made it possible. Mississippi gives us an idea of the intimacy of, of, of our living, mm. the contradictions in our living and the lies we tell ourselves to hide it all, right? So there's, I'm gonna just say this really quickly, Drew. At the moment, we need to investigate at the moment in which Governor Reeves signed the legislation to pull down that flag. He also vetoed legislation that would have benefited poor white people and black people in the state of Mississippi. So you got that symbolic gesture happening, mm -hmm. but at the level of policy, at the level of what was happening on the ground, we saw a pin that was exercised in the name of the status quo, contradictions. Mm -hmm. Uh, the blues, that's what it is, the blues. Uh, 
Oops. Boy, you're both so eloquent on the subject of Mississippi. I love it. It clearly is an emotional uh, trigger for, for you both. We have some questions from the audience that have been submitted in advance. So let me pose some of those to you in the last few minutes of our, of our conversation. One question uh, is the following. I'm curious about how public education can help play a part in social justice reform. Also wonder about thoughts on the issue of how textbooks are written and distributed to perpetuate false history. All three of us are educators, and so this seems to me very germane to, to, to the panel. So Dr. Simmons, Dr. Glad, any thoughts on how public education can play a part in social justice reform? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, it, it just, it, you, can't, you can't help but to be cliche about education. Education is our path forward. It is a critical tool in our toolkit when we talk about reform because education should change who you are. If you are not changed after receiving a quality education, I would argue you receive no education at all. We use mm -hmm. education as a tool for reform, as a tool for moving forward, and as a tool for avoiding mistakes of the past, right? Looking toward how we can be better. And so when we talk about education in the public space, this is where it becomes critically important because there it should be the great equalizer. There it should be the opportunity that others who because of socioeconomic status may not be afforded with an opportunity of quality education. But at the same time, the educational space is where some of the greatest inequities exist. And so education as a system becomes one that we have to dismantle. Not that we do away with the notion that education is important, that it's a critical you know, tool in our toolkit, that is, or even say that it's no longer useful. We have to look at what's happening and how we have shifted the purpose of education to we, we've dulled its edge for individuals of color and for individuals of poverty. We've dulled its edge. And that's been done in an intentional way. Again, when we see an overrepresentation of children of color uh, in specialized education, uh, 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 being disciplined uh, in, in school, then we're using now the educational system to create a pathway to incarceration. We all have heard about that narrative where now education is used as a pathway to incarceration. Yeah, that's where now that's a sort of form of slavery, right? That's free labor now, right? And so we we have to be, um, I, I would argue that we have to be very, very uh, aggressive and honest and um, and reflective about how we've used education not as a tool to uplift, but as a tool to divide. Again, in the midst of dismantling segregation, we have this resurgence of the pushback, right? Every time there's an attempt to dismantle, there's a resurgence. So we have to continue to keep chipping away at educational opportunities in the public sector, because again, this is where it can be the great equalizer for future generations of children. We need massive investment in public education because what we've witnessed over the last 40 to 50 years is a systematic defunding of public education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people are talking about defunding the police. We have been witnessing the defunding of public yeah. education for, for four decades, five mm -hmm. decades easily. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we've heard in the political, uh, on the political right attempts to demolish, I mean, to, to dismantle and disband the Department of Education because there's this sense, ever since Brown v. Board, uh, in 1954, there has been a sense of imposition, right? And how uh, discourses of liberty have been used to hold off the demand that we integrate um, 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 uh, our educational system. So the first thing we need to do is admit the truth that America has never committed itself to educating all of its children, period. And not just all of its black children, all of its children. So if you're white and poor, you haven't gained access to, to a quality public school education. And I'm of the mind, I'm a Dewey, I'm a Dewey, John Dewey scholar. So I think public education is absolutely critical to producing the kinds of people that democracies require. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have a robust public education system um, that in some ways not only gives us the, the resources to imagine ourselves beyond the limited circumstances of our, of our, of our birth uh, or whatever the circumstances of our birth may be, 
uh, then, then what we do really is we create the conditions under which, right, we produce individuals who cannot rise to the level that democracy requires of them, well, what democracy requires mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. So that sounds a lot like like German, like I'm talking about Bildung, where we're talking about educating character. That's okay. But 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 I think that's important. Yeah. And so what we need is a reinvestment in public education, a reinvestment in teachers. Well, we don't have this cycling out of the best teachers in the most vulnerable school districts. We need to untether the funding of schools to private to property taxes, which then reproduces all of these inequities in terms of how many dollars is example of systematic discrimination exactly. right yeah right because depending upon where you are, where you are. Uh, uh, results in how much money is spent per child mm -hmm. that makes no sense to me um, and so part of what we need i think is a wholesale investment in public education and understanding my son for example went to a private school i mean i'm outing myself he went to a private school and he went to the private school because there was three consecutive bomb threats in his elementary school. I said, this is ridiculous, right? And the private school was founded the very day after Brown v. Board of Education was, was, was rendered. So we have an entire structure, an educational system that reflects this racial divide. And let's bring it home even more, 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 more concretely. Donald Trump is clamoring for us to send our school kids back to school. And he's only talking about public schools. Mm -hmm. Whose children are going to be risked? That's right. Whose children are being thrown in, 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 in danger? Right. Let's ask that question. But it's a reflection of how we've approached our children uh, for, for generations. Can I build on your points with just two observations? One, I think you've been, you were directing your comments mostly to K-12 education, but I'd like yep. to extend some of your points to higher education as well, because we've defunded public higher education as at the same time that we've defunded um, primary and secondary education. And also the notion of what is education for? Is it to make you dream to aspire or is it to put you in a particular job slot that that won't change the status quo so much or will give you a decent living perhaps, but not enable you to dream the biggest dreams that, that you are capable of. So I think that it, we should think about higher education in terms of the points that the two of you, that the two oh, of you absolutely. made. And then I, the other thing I'd add is, as you were talking about what education should contain and all the things we've just been discussing about history and what we need to know and what we need to understand as the true nature of our past as a nation, those things have to be taught in our schools. We need civics education. We need to educate our students to be the kinds of citizens that we would like to, to have in our country. And that's something that we just abandon. We don't teach history in many schools. We just teach some kind of social studies amalgam that, that really doesn't ask the difficult questions that, that you both have been posing in the, in the last few minutes. Absolutely. There's a, a question, another question that I think is, is such a big one, but it, we're coming towards the end that I think I want to ask it because it'll give you a chance to bring things together. How do we use this moment to affect lasting change? What if what we've said in the past hour or so can help us to understand how to make the possibilities of this moment into realities? Well, um, responsibilities. I would say uh, there's so many. Well, the first thing and the very basic thing is to get started. Don't hide. Every American has a responsibility to move the nation forward on this issue. Silence is hostility toward this work. You cannot hide. You cannot be silent. And oftentimes I am sensitive to that there are often many people who just don't know what to say, who don't understand whether or not their voice would be valued in conversations around equity. They're afraid of saying the wrong thing. Well, the only wrong thing you can do is say nothing at all. And what I think is encouraging about what we're seeing across the nation is we see an elevation of voices in a way that we have not seen in modern history. Right Since the civil rights movement, we've seen our young folks out on the front lines in ways and initiating in ways that we have not seen as a collective across the nation. 
And so what I think is really important that, you know, we subject ourselves to repeating uh, the mistakes of the past. Uh, when we do that, we normalize this unhealthy oppression that prevents us from enjoying the benefit of a collective effort toward a great nation. And our systems have created conditions where there is a zero sum gain in inequities in education, health, economic well-being. Uh, and when people feel they are getting ahead because of racism, the overall system suffer. And the fact of the matter is that when we reduce and eliminate racial disparities, America does better in this whole notion of adaptive change that when one group does better, another group does bad. It's just a cancerous line of thinking that threatens the morality of the country. So we all have to take an ownership in, in where and how we show up in this quest toward making sure that the American dream is possible for every American in our nation, no matter what they look like, no matter what they believe, no matter, no matter who they love, we have to make sure that America is a safe space for everyone to live and be happy and to love. I think that personal, that personal commitment is a starting place. Great. That's, oh, I got to follow that. Yep. <laughs> so um, I'm sitting here thinking about this, right? We, we can't tinker around the edges. We have to be bold. We have to dare to imagine a different way of being together. That's the key. Um, one, you know, I, I say this to my students all the time, and I've been saying this around the country. You know, um, one of the most insidious things about our current moment is the all-out assault on our imagination. That we can't imagine ourselves differently, mm -hmm. which means we're almost always permanently docked in the station, right? Um, and you know, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson says, God speaks to us through our imaginations. I tell my students this all the time. And if God speaks to us through our imaginations, then what is the devil doing, right? So kind of narrowing our vision that we can only tinker around the edges, that we can't really transform this, the real fundamental uh, aspect of our living, right? When we know that this place is broken, what can we do to ensure systemic long-term change? We have to dare to imagine boldly. We have to be creative. We have to freedom dream, as Robin Kelly would say. And that, to my mind, begins with building a real, imagining a, a, a robust public infrastructure of care, reimagining safety, understanding that if you work 40 to 60 hours a week, you should have, you should be able to not only take care of yourself and keep a roof over your head, but you should be able to take care of your kids, right? A living wage. Begin to think differently about how you and I can be together, right? How we can live together where we don't be, where we're not mysteries to one another. Right? Bold thinking is what is required for systemic change. Um, risk, as the, as the activists would say, we got to risk everything right now, right here, right now, right here. That's what I think will be the, the basis of, of long-term change. And I think it has to be based in the values you spoke about and thinking about what really are our values as a nation and as individuals and also what we have as responsibilities to one another, which I think has been so underscored by the experience of the last four months. And let's hope mm -hmm. it can bring the kind of momentum for the change that you two just spoke so eloquently about. I'm now gonna turn this back to Mitch, who has a few parting words, but I wanna thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. I learned a lot and I enjoyed our interactions very much. Thank, thank you. you. Mitch, over to you. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you, Drew. I, I just say, wow. If we were in an auditorium, I can assure you everybody listening would be standing up <laughs> and applauding the incredible, heartfelt insights and thoughts that all of you gave to us today. You know, I hate to out myself, but I, my people from Mississippi too, Lawrence, Mississippi, and then Bay St. Louis. And then I jumped over to Louisiana, which looks a whole lot and feels a whole lot uh, with those moss covered trees like Mississippi does. So, I'm so thankful to get that perspective. You know, Dr. Glady said it all comes back to a central idea uh, from the beginning that black lives were inferior. That was the practice, but the preaching was about all of us coming to the table of democracy as equals. And of course the hypocrisy is uh, based on what you all have 
so eloquently spoken to us about today is we've never really practiced that. And that transformation that we all talked about and that call to action that Tamika uh, told us about and the uh, hypocrisy even today of, yeah, taking one step to take down the Confederate flag, but at the same time vetoing a piece of legislation that took us into action is the next space. So I thank you all for helping us tell the truth uh, today about our history. Um, we should all be committed uh, to move into action, to transformation, because only those things are going to take us towards reconciliation. So I thank you all for giving us such an incredible education today and for being in this moment for the rest of the country, because if we ever get it right, um, we have a wonderful future together, but not much uh, of a future if we don't go hand in hand. So God bless you all. Thank you all so much. Uh, and hopefully everybody will tune in next week. Have a great day.